So the turn the papers back to uh, Professor Xie as soon as possible. Thank you. So welcome back. We have uh, lesson six in the pro progress right now. So let's look at the title for this one, Structure and Change in Economic History. So now from this, uh, from this week, we are going to have some series and a very uh, profound starting knowledge for international political economy. So today we talk about the structure and the change of economic history. Have you ever thought about one very simple issue, question? Throughout the history, throughout the history, we human beings always go to market to make exchange, right? So nowadays we just bring our money to get it to get our food to get the goods that we need for our daily uh, life. And uh, in the ancient time, our, the, those, pre, lo, those people, our not necessarily our ancestors, just those, those people, they went to the market, not necessarily with their money, because at that time they might have no money at all, but they would bring their cattle or their, their cattle all their, their all kind of products to make exchange. So it's a kind of barter history, barter economy. So it's just, just make exchange. So the way we have right now is not necessary, just pop out over there. So look here, we have evolved ourselves from barter economy, market economy to currency economy. And in terms of economy, there are a lot, a lot of issues we will need to concern. For example, what is the balance of payments? What is GMP? What is GDP? There are so many terms out there, right? And overall, who make, who have the authority to make the policy for you in terms of how much tax you need to pay or how much tuition you need to pay to the Wenzhou? And how many foreign students that Wenzhou is willing to take in and offer them scholarship and uh, some of them may not have the scholarship. So uh, what are the criteria? They are all belong to the human beings' decisions, right? So let's take a side of this complexity for now. Let's just focus on the economic history. The structure throughout the economic history is not all the same. We talk about barter economy. We talk about a money exchange economy, right? They are different. So why they are different? How they have become different? What are the determining, determining factors to make such dif different differences? So we have witnessed the structure is changed. So let's give you one example. When I first arrived in the United States in 19, wow, let's, long ago, 1987, the first time, I went to the United States for my master degree. At that time, Taiwanese government had a very strict policies about foreign exchange that I could bring to the United States. So if you, at that time, I, well, my purpose was for studying. So I was allowed to carry 10,000 USD at that time to the United States. So at most, I can make such exchange. And the process of making such exchange is, uh, is a long-lasting process. I needed to go to the bank and file the application. And the clerk sitting in front of me would receive my paper and then went back to see her uh, supervisor to get approval. So you can see the process is full of bureaucracy, right? But nowadays, nowadays, we are different. Our experiences of the money transfer is totally different, right? So how soon, if you really want to deliver some money to the United States or some other countries, how soon? Almost instantly. 
You don't need to get the pr approval from the bank because I can do this from my cell phone. Very quick, very quick, right? So life is different. So the structure is changed. The way we play the game of economy is also changed, right? So now we just have some very, very basic idea about why those change, and those change are related to the economic structure we have today. Okay, so now let's go to the online here. First of all, how much money you can earn per capita? Per capita, capita means head, your head. Each head grows. How much money you can have through your life? Actually, the rate of per capita growth rate is a function of the population growth rate. Well, to put it simply in this way, if we have more people, we will become poorer. That's very simple. Very simple, right? So basically, the more people we have in this global village, the poorer you would experience in the future. So you can imagine that when you, your generations become richer than we were, well, according to the phenomenon, population growth, not likely, very unlikely, because you were facing a lot of problems of the low salaries and the hard working environment and so on and so on. Let me give you one, another example. When I graduated from my school in 1983, just fresh out from the college, right? At that time, I still remember my first job offered me around 15,000 NT. 15,000 NT at that time. Well, not much, of course, right? But remember, how long was it ago? 1983, right? It's uh, 2017, uh, it's, wow, it's 39, 49 years ago, 39 years ago, 49 years ago, I, I couldn't remember. It's, it's very hard, 39 years ago, almost four decades ago. So this is an entry level for me, entry level salary for me, right? So at that time, I could use my money, my salary to buy my first house. And uh, what is the price for my first hour house? I work after one year and I purchased my first hour house. At that time, the house was so inexpensive, in a sense. How much is that? I still remember the figure, so I would love to write out for you. $709,000 for my first house. Apartment, a small unit, but good enough for me and my future wife at that time, right? So you can compare the salary and the housing price at the time. But now, what it would be your entry level salary for today? Well, normally it would be somewhere between around 30,000, I think, in the future, including bonus, salary, purse, and so on, right? So this 30,000 NT. And what would be the property if you really like to purchase one? My goodness, even I myself cannot afford to buy a new house today. Really, I tell you. Because I have shopped around the housing market. Uh, in the beginning of the year, I found every house is so, so, so expensive. My goodness. So, the house, the apartment unit I, I, ha I have been interested in now is around 10 million. You can do the math. You will know life is getting tougher, right? Why? Well, inflation is one. Um, everything is appreciated in some way is another one, right? But to some extent is that we have too, too many people, <laughs> too many people out there. Too many people out there, so maybe, I don't know how to solve the problem, but indeed, how much money you can learn, earn throughout your life, all determined on how many people we have in the whole wide world, in general, in general, okay? 
And after we talk about this, and uh, we will f go back to uh, highlight English etymology and some of the sentence tenses. Today we talk about tenses here, past tense, and present tense, and future tense. And so we have assignments by the end. Okay, let's look at uh, the lecture here. So first of all, long-term growth rate is a function of per capita divided by the function of population. So you can see the formula here, right? It's, it's not that complicated. So if we want to look at the long-term growth rate for our human society, there are two major factors we have to look at. One, one is how much money we can have, right? The more you have, the better economy prospect. But the problem is that the function of per capita income has to be divided by the population. So you can imagine that the more people we have, the growth rate will be smaller. So this is a very easy understood phenomenon, right? So here comes the main thing of the argument. The main thing of the argument, that is, the fundamental forces, the basic forces affecting the long term, which means circular, in our life, our daily life, our societal, social, circular, not God. We live here, so we live in a circular world, so not in the God's heaven, right? So we now live here. So the long term circular growth path will still be determined by the function of income saved. Per capita growth rate would then be a result of population growth rate. If you want to become rich, you have to save your money, right? And uh, in order to save more money, you have to work hard so you could have more money for yourself. But in the market of full of competition, there are so many people out there competing for the same job, same category, right? So you can imagine that if we have more people, then the opportunity of the, or oh, the opportunity of again earning more money will become more difficult. But it's okay, Let, let's go further to look at this. So people, population, is the negative indicator for your income, period. Okay, for now, well, let's know that. Okay, so we can contract this, we can compare this model to the class model of Matthews and Ricardo. Now, let me tell you the Matthews and Ricardo. Matthews emphasized on the growth of the population, okay, for one. And Ricardo emphasized on the opportunity cost. For example, you are now sitting in the classroom, right? So, in the same time, you have some opportunity cost out there. For example, if you work part-time for some that's a cram school, and because you have to come here, so you do not have the ability to teach English in the cram school, right? So suppose you sit here for three hours, the opportunity cost for you not to teach the kids in the cram school for three hours, let's say if your hourly wage is 300 or 350 or 400, then your opportunity cost will be around 900 to 1,200 dollars, which you cannot earn. So this is the main thing of Ricardo. Okay, so let's look at this. So we look at uh, Matthews and Ricardo, two men. We found out that this kind of decimal results, it refers to this one. It refers to this one, population, population growth rate will be negatively correlated to your growth rate, the money you can earn, very simple. Okay, so this kind of small results of the classical model, this is a classical model indicate. Up 10, it has this, because there exists a fixed factor. Why population matters? More people we have, fewer money, less money you could earn. Why is that? Because there's a very important consideration here. 
the land resources are fixed. Can you expand your land and extract your resources unlimitedly? Of course not. There is always a limitation out there, right? So let's look here. We have a fixed factor, land and resources out there, which is not possible for you to expand unlimitedly. The only thing we can expand is people, right? So look here. If we use this, this is the, for example, this is the total resources we have. And uh, if we have the peop population in the whole wide world just like this, uh, if we have the people population, if we have population this, so every, every people, every person in the whole world can have a larger share of the resources, right? But let's imagine this. If we increase the population to this much, then every rate of people here <laughs> will have a smaller share of the blue assets, right? So the more you have, so let's imagine this. If we have more people like this, oh my goodness, even tinier. Smaller and smaller. If we have this much of the people, <laughs> you can imagine the share you can have coming out of the fixed land and resources with even, even smaller, right? So to some extent, philosophically, it would be good for you if the whole wide world, only you living here. <laughs> you could have all. You could have all, right? If you are the only one. But unfortunately, it's not the case. But still, it, this one is a very simple explanation about your income, right? But economists have different thoughts about They have arguments about this. It's not true. Come on. Look at here. We have uh, technology. We can make agricultural products to feed all the people. No matter how much, how, how many people in the whole wide world, you can still feed them. And look here. We have the modern convenience that offer all of the people, right? So there's no problem. Oh, pollution, no, 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 that is not the case. Because we have the purifier, <laughs> we have air purifier. We can install at home, right? We can still survive. So look at what we have in terms of material life. Material life, of course, today we have air conditioners. We have every com modern convenience, and we never thought about that at all, right? So if we trace back to 50 years ago, when I was young, when I was young, it was unheard of about anything related to air conditioner. What was that? We have fan, yes, electricity or oh, hand. We do have fan, but we don't have air conditioners at all, right? And uh, at that time, it would be very difficult to have, uh, have not a, to own a car, not only a car. It would be very difficult to see my neighbors, any of my neighbors owning a car. Because everyone is have a bicycle, is riding a bicycle, a motorcycle, that would, would be the best choice of transportation. A car, oh my goodness, that is too expensive, right? And the first TV we have at my home, we, our family, is the first one to own a black, white TV in our neighborhood. So every, every evening, all the kids just bring their, their, their chairs and sitting around our, 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 our door and then jamming in our living room to watch the TV show because this is the only one. Time is different, right? Time is different. So look here. The world population is expanding and they are all focused on the rated resources here. And the resources here cannot be proportionally expanded. Cannot. Just there. At most, with the help of technology, we sometimes can expand the resources like this. Right? But one thing for sure, it cannot be expanded proportionally along with the path of the population. So eventually, we have more and more people to compete with the very limited resources and land. So this why we become poorer it is because of this. Okay, so the fixed factor. It's very important for us to understand when being taken together, 
with the ubiquitous, ubiquitous means overall universal tendency of population to expand. See that? There's no way for you to avoid. There's no way for you to avoid. And uh, in this regard, and uh, that will be a result for sure. It will be lead a circular tendency that the way our life to a subsistence wage. What is the meaning of subsistence? Low and uh, just barely survivable wage subsistence. Once again, previously we have this much of resources. People are not so much, so we are happy with that. And uh, along with the expanding of the population, the competition becomes fiercer. And the ability to acquire more becomes more difficult, right? And we can e imagine that the expansion of the population will only continue. So in this regard, in this regard, the best you can hope for is that to get something that you can live on. To earn something, to make some money, you can still be yourself, subsisting wage. I mean, in general. Of course, some of you maybe become very rich in the future, right? But most of us will become poorer and poorer. Well, this is very dismal, <laughs> very, un very unhappy ending for all human beings, right? Don't be so pessimistic. We have ways to change that. We have different perspectives to look at the world we have. But basically, this is what we have. We have observed from the so-called classical economists. Classical economists emphasize on the limited resources and the expansion of the population. So they all predicted that people will become poorer and poorer. But today, not quite so, right? Compared with uh, what we had four decades ago, maybe we are not that luxury, but we are definitely not that poor. Is that right? We definitely are not that poor. We are still managed to have a good life, just in a different way, different way. So the classical explanation of the way we are going to make our money may be somewhat misleading. Not quite so. So let's continue to look at. So that's why we say both models provide powerful insights for some explanation. Both model, one is Matthew, the other one is, one is classical approach, the other one is neoclassical approach. So let's look at this one. The neoclassical approach, we have two different approach here. One is classical economics. Classical economics emphasize on the expansion of the population and the limited resources. But neoclassical economics point out there's a possibility for us to supply more. So here we have the so-called elastic supply curve. How can we supply more for the expanded population? Let's say previously we have uh, third, we have uh, three billion people in the whole world, right? It's a lot, but now we have around uh, seven billion. But those economies don't worry too much. It, it's okay because uh, we have the ability to supply, and the supply curve is there. So we can call that is an electric supply curve, which means we can stretch. We can stretch it. To the limit, we can still supply more for the people we have. So let's look at this. Neoclassical approach uh, is kind of optimistic. They are, okay, no problem. We are still in a very good world, wonderful world. And then the other one is a classical approach. They are very pessimistic. You are doomed <laughs> in the in visionary, right? So let's look at the, the comparison between these two. Both the optimistic model of a neoclassical economics and the pessimistic model of a classical economics provide powerful insights into economic history. Why, when we, in turn, when we talk about economic history, why this approach 
are capable of for us to understand how we evolve economically throughout the history. Well, there's a huge difference. Before industrialization revolution, the revolution of industry, sometime happening in the late 18th, 19th century and uh, around 19th century. So we see the manufacturing was made by machine afterward, right? Previously, previously, before the industrial revolution, we found out that if you want to produce something, you need to use men, laborers, only laborers, right? But afterward, we use machine. A machine provides a very, very important input for the supply. Because with machine, we, our supply is elastic, can be stretched, can be stretched out. So these are the differences. So if we want to observe any things happened before, let's say, 18th, 19th century, we could use classical approach to understand what happened out there, because men is very important at that time. But for now, if we want to observe what happened after the Industrial Revolution, then neoclassical approach may be better. So both approach are good for us to understand the power can provide powerful insight into our economic history. So let's take a look, the former. The former refers to neoclassical economics, right? With its elastic supply curve of new knowledge and uh, substitutability at the own margin. So look here. Because we are smart, we have a technology. So we can use a lot of new knowledge and to invent a lot of goods to substitute the previous ones we need, right? For example, in Taiwan, we eat rice. Rice is the main commodity for food on your table, right? Okay, fine. But what about one day we do not eat so much rice? What can we do? It's okay, we can produce some kind of rice cake. This is the new knowledge to produce some substitutability. We can eat bread, bagels even, right? We can substitute the things. We don't count down the one, only one product. We have many, many different choices. Uh, the possibility is always there. So here, because the modern technology provides us the ability to produce more. So this is almost equal to the unparalleled growth experience of Western economies since the second economic revolution. So what have we have seen today, right? We have seen a lot of materials, new materials, made possible for us. Before the economic revolution, we only see labor, laborers, right? If you want to have one product, you have to make it by your hands. But now we have all the possibility of production over there. So products are not the problem. We have uh, almost unlimited ability to supply. Why? Because we have new knowledge. And we have a lot of different sources to produce. We talk about substitutability. We can substitute the original production factors. Okay, this is the former one. Why they are so optimistic? Uh, the later one, why they are so pessimistic? Well, the pessimistic one emphasizes the later sets economic history in a persistent tension between population and the resource base. To supply more is not possible because the resources are limited over there, right? But on the other hand, those economists, classical economists, saw the expansion of the population. They're worried. They feel sad. They do not have the optimistic view about the human, fu human future. They only see misery result. People will get poorer. People will starve to death. Because look at that, so many people, and we have few, so few resources out there. This is very pessimistic, right? OK, so, but this approach 
Thus, it's a far more useful starting point, basically, to explore the human experience in the millennia prior to the middle of the 19th century. So now we see the difference between these two perspectives, right? Neoclassical approach allow us to appreciate the importance of the new knowledge, the possibility that could be made by the new knowledge, all the products, all the supply, right? So although we are facing the same expansion of the population, we see that, but it does not constitute a serious concern. But for classical economists, because of their time, they do not see, they did not see the advance of technology. So the, part, the only possible means for them to produce is by hands, right? So population and the resources are contradictory. So in this regard, they cannot, they could not be happy. It's not possible. But, but this perspective is very useful for us to observe what happened before 19th century. It is the time everything is manufactured by hands, right? So lands, resources, and the population are were equally important for the production. Very simple. But can we use the same economics, the so-called classical economist, to observe what happened today? Not really, right? Because we have new knowledge. We have a new modes of production. We have all sorts of possibility to make things happen. That's great. That's very great, right? Okay, so we have, but, <laughs> but here, although they are powerful, they do provide very powerful insights for us to observe what happened throughout the history in terms of economy. Before 19th century, it would be much better for us to observe history, economy, economic, economic history, with the perspective of a classical economist. After that, it would be better we shift to the neoclassical approach. Okay, that'll be fine, but both are not complete. They are not complete in the sense. Let's see. Let's see the two problems. The original neoclassical model and the classical model what are lacking there? Let's see this one. The, the original neoclassical model, they emphasize on three preconditions. The so-called, which has the, the three conditions, which are very, very important. One, they assume, they assume the state is neutral. They assume the state did not interfere into the market operation. The market should be there, alone and independent from the government intrusion. Okay, so they assume the first one. But the problem is that, can a state be really neutral? Not really. A state, the relationship between state and the market it's always a uh, very intriguing relations talked about, talked much about by those philosophers, by those economists. The most important issues re between market and the government or the state is that one question asked, how much does the state need to intrude, intervene into the market operation? How much? The more you want the government to intervene, the market market, market, in, market operations, and those economies, people call them are uh, conservatives. They are the right wings, conservatives. Most of the time, conservatives emphasize on the important, okay? So basically, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. I have to change that, not conservative, <laughs> totally wrong, totally wrong, I'm sorry, um, my bad. It's those who emphasizing on more intrusion from the state is the left. The left, they are 
they emphasize more on the state intervention for the government. But for the right, they emphasize on no government intrusion at all. So basically, we could use a very simple chart to tell the difference. So if this is a political spectrum, and this is neutral, so basically we have a right here, right? And we have a left here. And the key difference between the right and the left is on only one thing. The level of government intervention into the market. Basically, the left emphasizes more into intervention. And the right emphasizing on less intervention. That's it. Very simple. So market and uh, government. Market and the state. So basically, if you are a member belong to the left, you prefer more state intervention into the market. If you are a person in the right, then you prefer less intervention from the government. That's it. So this is a very simple. You have learned this from political science, right? And this is very easy. Left and right. So to the extreme, we see this one, for example, this one is the communism. And this one is a total conservatism. So it's very, very, very funny. So this is a very simple way for us to, uh, to tell the differences. OK, so let's come back here. With this regard, a neutral state is very difficult to obtain. But we have to accept it. So our, percept, our explanation based on neoclassical model can stand true. So this is the first problem. The second problem is that we have to accept zero transaction costs, which means buy and sell. There's no transaction costs. The government does not take money from you, does not have tax upon you. So when it doesn't matter how many times you transact, you, you buy and sell, buy and sell, right? It's free. But in uh, our real world, it's not free at all. You can test that. You go to the bank, go to the ATM and withdraw the money. You will be deducted for $5 here in Taiwan, right? And that is the transaction cost. There's no way for you to skip that. So here is very difficult to obtain. And the third part is also very difficult to stand to. Stay, that is, that we have to assume all the customers, all the people have constant tests. What does that mean? It means that people's customers' preference should be remaining as stable as possible. Why this is important? Why is this important? For example, Apple iPhone. Apple produced to have a new model every year, right? So starting from Apple one, iPhone 1 to iPhone 14, next year we predicted to have iPhone 15. Why they can make such a prediction? Because customers' tests are constant in some way. Let's imagine this. This year, because people love to have an iPhone, so iPhone 14, let's say the total production is 20 million. 20 million, okay, that would be great. And the 20 million is a figure based on the previous year's project, prospect, right? So 20, 20 million for this year, and success, great. And how about next year? then Apple company will make some prediction. And the prediction must be based on the constant test of the customers. They need to presume people still love to have iPhone, right? Okay, so next year, and they consider the economic prospect or the GDP prospect, GMP prospect, all the economic indicators combined together, they predict, oh, maybe next year we could produce 21 millions of iPhone, iPhone 15, right. Okay, so this assure one thing.
because of the constant test from the consumers, from the consumers, all, all the producers can have a stable and a confident prediction about their products. But if we do not have this, if we do not have this, right? And the uh, Apple company produce, predict to produce 21 million next year, and they have to acquire all the raw materials, all the spare parts. And uh, suddenly, people just change their test, suddenly. And no one loves to have iPhone anymore. So strange, right? <laughs> and all of this will be doomed, right? So it's really, it's really, people have to remain constant tests. Yes, it is true to some industry, but not quite so to some other indus industries. Why? Let me give you some explanation. For example, fashion industry. Fashion industry changed years after years, right? I always wonder why my students get poorer and poorer every time, every year. Previous, about five or six years ago, everyone that wear rock pants, there are these holes here. See? There's a why you become poorer? Look at that. You wear jeans and there's a hole here, and there's a hole here. So strange. You're poorer, right? And this year, just around two years ago, and there's no clothes here. They become fuller. Fashion tests change all the time. For fashion industry, it will be very difficult for them to make a prediction. What kind of products they want to produce, right? And that will be. So that's why I say constant taste may be applied to some industry, but not to all the industries, right? So let's take a look at about the three test conditions that required by the original neoclassical models. A neutral state, is that true? No, state cannot be neutral. State always takes actions to intervene into the market in a matter of quick or slow, but they all intervene, they all intervene. And the other one is zero transaction costs. Will that be possible? Not quite, impossible, right? unless you are a VIP customer, unless you are a VIP. For example, I and uh, my account is from Yusan Bank, right? Because I am professor. So actually, I did not need to pay the transaction cost for withdrawing money from every ATM. But they do not charge me on this, but they charge me on other <laughs> issues. The same, the same, right? And the other one is a constant test. Do not apply to all industries. Okay, so we have question marks here. So basically, we need to accept this so that we can use this to have a useful framework for analysis. Okay, so basically we need to make sure only this test condition will were approximated. They are there, so we can use the neoclassical approach to understand the so-called new knowledge and the subsidiarity, and based on this, we can have an elastic supply curve for all the human beings, but we have to accept this. And uh, this is difficult. So a lot of different economies, they have thought about how to deal with this. So some of them provide the modified version. Modified version, what is that? They're incorporating the so-called positive transaction costs. That is, although I withdraw money from the ATM, I need to pay $5 to the bank. But the payment for $5 will be offset by the other higher transaction income that I could possibly make by me. So basically, whenever I make a trans transaction, I actually create more welfare for myself. Okay, great. So go to the bank and withdraw money and more money, right? For example, you withdraw money become the, let's say, the cost for buying something. And you can resell that to that. So the cost will be, well, manageable. So this is the, the so-called positive transaction cost. And also a theory of a state. A theory of the state, it means that 
on what ground state should intervene into the, into the market. The state intervention, it can be used to prevent the catastrophe of the market operation. So there are many different kinds of state theories. So we are using that. So basically, the original neoclassical model are not so complete because the three test conditions are in doubt. And uh, after that, we have a lot of different modification to, to say, okay, this is a worry, but we can deal with that. So they change a lot. So this is the so-called neoclassical model in completeness. And the, on the other side, what about the classical model? Classical model is always, always, always facing the difficulties because there's no way for the classical model to escape. Is this small implication between population and the limited resources. There is always there. However, some scholars like uh, Easter Bostra from Yale University indicate that, oh, don't worry about this. He, she said, population is good. <laughs> population is good. Can sometimes act as a spur to induce new technology, techniques. Because we have people, right? So people could be a problem, but people could be an asset too. With people, we could have more technology, more new technology techniques here. But the problem is she does not provide any kind of theoretical bridge to account for the overcoming the diminishing returns of to a factor, fixed factor. Okay, what is diminishing returns to a fixed factor? Let me give you one example. It's good to have a teacher to teach students, right? So now we have two teachers to teach you, 81 students. That would be great. How about we introduce another one, a fixed factor of teacher to here. So now we have three teachers. That would be still good, right? And uh, we continue to include more teachers. How, how about we have 10 teachers, professors here to teach you? we found out that the return of the added factors for teachers is diminishing. How about this? We invite all the faculty members in Wenzhou to join us in the classroom. 250, <laughs> you can imagine this. Yes, we have increased more production factor teacher, right? But the return is diminishing. So this is the so-called diminished returns of a fixed factor. It does not say the more you have, get input, then the more you will get it back. No, because the resources are the same. So addition of one factor does not guarantee you have the equally proportional growth of the, or everything else. No, not possible. So two teachers for the students here are good, two hundreds are definitely not good because we have only one microphone, right? So, so if we ask all the professors to stand here and smiling at you, well, that is good, but not necessary. Diminishing return of one fixed factor refers to that. Okay, let's have a 10 minutes break and come back later. So we now know both approaches are lacking something over there, right? The neoclassical approach set a very important three assumptions out there. A neutral state, not quite possible. Zero transaction costs, not quite possible. And a constant test, not so insured in a sense, right? But in order for us to fully explain the history of economy by using neoclassical model, we have to, uh, have to accept that, but it's difficult. And the other one, the difficulty for a classical model is that the population, the tension between population and the fixed resources is still over there, right? So it's very difficult. So do we have another approach? Well, maybe we have some, one other explanation about the economic history. That is, hey guys, technological change is the core. Nothing else, just this. 
This one is very important. So let's talk about, uh, talk about the change of technology. It is difficult to pin down the Marxism model. Marxism model, wow, that's great. We talk about Marxism, right? So Marxian model, since there appear to be almost um, as many interpretation, interpretation of Marx, as they are Marxian theorists. So Marxism, well in Taiwan we do not like Marxism at all, but Marxism does have some merits for us to understand the change of history in terms of economy. Okay, and he point out the important core component for economic history is the change of technology, technological change. Okay, he regarded technological change, but not population growth as the primary engine for change. Indeed, sometimes he is right. Sometimes he is right. Not because of we have more people. It is because we have more but we have much better technology, which can change our human structure. Okay, so let's focus on the change of technology for now. And he was critical of Matthew, Matthew's view. Matthew's view is about expansion of population and limited resources, classical resource, right? Okay, so, and Matthew's view about people, Matthew believed that. Matthew believe that people tend to breed to subsistence, poor and poorer, and regarded fertility as culturally determined. Wow, this is very racism, right? <laughs> Look at that. Some country have more babies. Oh, greatness, goodness. That's because of their culture, huh? Of course, we do not accept this kind of concept, right? But some people do think about it as that way, racism, very racism. Because they are poor, they have nothing to do, so they build babies, huh? So strange, okay? Culturally bias, but this is based by Matthew. Why they have more people? Because they culturally accept more people, right? Okay, and so Marx is critical about this view. And in the Marxian model, what does he believe? Technological change, it is actually, it is the technological change leads to production techniques. We have a better technology, so we have a better way to manufacture, right? So it is the technological change to make our history changed, but not the population. And uh, this kind of technological change is potential cannot be realized within the existing economic organization. Okay, what does that mean? We have new technology, right? But the current structure, current legal system, do not allow the full use of the new technology, for example. We, now we are facing a lot of use, a lot, a lot of circulation for crypto, cryptocurrencies like a uh, doggy money or like a uh, uh, ether, uh, there's a, a lot of cryptocurrencies out there, right? But the problem is that who has the right to control the currency, this kind of cryptocurrencies? Almost none. Almost no central banks from any government can do that. So they, they, we see there's a lack of legal structure to oversee the operation of this kind of currencies, right? So now we face a dilemma. Now we have a new technology. But to fully use the new technology, we need to have a comprehensive set of legal regulation to use this, right? The social structure has to be changed for the use of the new technology. But let's look at the, what we have right now. We do not have the suitable structure to use the potential of the cryptocurrency. So what happened? The society has to change. So now the simple argument is that we have new knowledge, we have a new technology, and the old society cannot meet the full potential of the new knowledge. 
Then what happened? The old society has to be changed. They have to change to adopt the use of the new technology. So we see the cycle here, right? New technology, old society, old society is not good. Change that to make it become a new society. So the new society can use the full potential of the new technology. So who make the society change? Oh, not about people. It's about new technology, right? This is a very simple argument of Marxism. Technology. Okay, because of this kind of the power potential. So the result is to energize a new class to overthrow the existing system. Who are the new class here we talk about? Let's see this one. New technology, right? The new class who use, who are benefited from the cryptocurrencies. They believe that they have to maintain their interests. They have to have fight their rights. But they look at the old society, they, can, they cannot find, any, find out any legal protection, any ways for them to, pro, to, to uh, play the game. And they have no way to realize the potential of the cryptocurrency. So the new class, who are the players of this kind of money, they ask their government, hey, you need to change. You are old, you need to change. So you see, new technology, now we need to add in one very important ingredient, that is new class. So new technology, then there will be a new class using the new technology. And the new class living in the old society, and they found out the old society is so bad, they need to change. So they ask, they push the old society to change. Okay, and the old society, first, they will be very reluctant. And gradually, they have to accept. So they also change the old society into the new society. So then the new society accept the use of the new technology. So we see the linkage here, right? New technology, the people who use the new technology formed a new class. The new class living in an old society, they feel, they feel disgusted. And uh, they want them to change. So the so old society change into a new society to use the new technology. But the problem is that the process of changing the old society into the new society can be very, very violent, right? Because the new society, sometimes it's very peaceful. They can go to the, let's say, the, uh, the Congress to ask for reform, right? They can go on the street to, to, to go on strike or to demonstrate their power, say, we want this, we want that, we want this, right? Okay, just, some, just like something happening in 19th century in England, right? That women need to vote. So they have a bill. Fortunately, the law was in the England. They passed the bill to allow women to vote, or otherwise uh, women will stand up and vote, revolt against the government. <laughs> Fortunately, at that time. Okay, so any kind of social change is uh, full of unpredicted factors out there. Some of them are very dangerous. Some of them are very peaceful, right? We have no guarantee. So here, the result to energize to energize a new class, to overthrow the existing system. The word overthrow, it refers to violent revolution, right? Revolution. So that's why Marxism is not welcomed by many different states. Because although its, its idea, its principles, its understanding about the change of the history is making sense to some extent, but the way, the, but the way of the change in the old society into the new society is most of the time very violent with revolution, with revolution. That is bad, right? Okay, so basically the new class will overthrow the existing system and develop a new set of property rights, new ways of the social system, right? To allow the class, that class, 
to realize the potential of the new technology, techniques. So here comes the driving force for the so so social change, the change of the society start with the technology. The new technology, the new class. The new class does not feel happy. They look at the old society, they overthrow the old society and create a new system. And under the new system, they create a new set of property rights or legal regulation to protect their interests. So they can fully use, use the benefits out from the new techniques. So we see the logical link here, right? So Marx is right as something. That is indeed, to some extent, the change of technology can make the society change. Okay, but do you see problem here? Do you see problem here? There are a lot of problems. One, what kind of change can make such change? <laughs> we do have a lot of technological change through our history, right? For example, the invent, invention of the smartphone, the use of the cryptocurrency, and uh, the invention of the planes, and the invention of the automobiles, uh, the many different kinds, electronic cars and so on. There are so many different kinds of technological change. Is that right? But the problem here, one problem, what kind of change can make a society change? Can really make a society change? It's very difficult. Does, did Mark say anything about this? Sorry, no. No, because it's very difficult to classify. What kind of change really it is? There's no such thing yet. Not yet. So this is the first problem, right? And the second problem is that when we talk about the new class, the statement here is that we assume the unity of the new class. But in practice, even though we have the new class, the class itself does not have the common interest most of the time. Yes, for example, the new technology, for example, the iPhone 14. If the iPhone 14 is a incredibly the new technology. And yeah, I'm, I will be a user for that one. But my interest of using the new technology will be certainly from the your interest of using that technology, right? So when you say we are in the new class, but actually our interests are not quite the same. So will we just stand up to say, hey, let's fight against the old system? Not quite, right? And uh, did Marx say anything about this? No, <laughs> again. So he just popped out the issue, but he did not provide the solutions. Okay, let's continue. So Marxism, if we use Marxism as a tool to explain secular change, well, it's quite good because it is powerful. Powerful for us to understand. The Marxism, Marxism framework is the most powerful of the existing statement of secular change. Why it is so powerful? Because it includes all the elements left out of the neoclassical framework. When we talk about neoclassical economies approach, economic approach, we emphasize on new technology, new knowledge, right? And also substitute substitutability. But who produces it? Who makes the law? Are all excluded from a mere classical approach? And uh, is this important institutions? Of course. Is this property rights? Of course. The state ideology, they are all important factors for the market operation. For example, in Taiwan, we have uh, Environmental Protection Agency. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> it's great for us to have, right? But to tell you, 30 years ago, Taiwan did not have Environmental Protection Agency. We did not have. Why? Because environmental protection is not a, was not an issue 30 years ago. 
economic development is, but not environmental protection. So look here. A government has one environmental protection agency. It gives up a very strong signal. That is, hey guys, environmental protection is very important. Right? So inst institutions matter, of course. If you have a Ministry of National Defense, you are talking about national defense. You have the institution to run the job, right? But do you know that some other countries do not have the Ministry of National Defense? Smaller countries, they do not need to defend, right? Okay? So look here. If they do not have the institution, it means that they do not have, they, they do not emphasize on that function. So institution is important. And how about property rights? Of course, let's, let me ask you one question. When you work, when you earn your, make your own money, when you have your savings, when you buy your properties, do you want them to be protected? Uh, of course, that is one of the purpose, one of the reason we join the society, right? Have you ever heard of other social contracts? You must have. You must have, right? Rousseau, Locke, telling you the protection of the property, the desire to protect your property is one major reason why people want to join in one society, right? Okay, so property rights is very important. How about the state? State was intentionally excused, excluded by neoclassical modern uh, economies. They emphasize no state interruption, right? But state is there. And most important of all is ideology. Why e ideology important? Why is ideology important? Now I want to ask you one very simple question. Anyone can tell me. What is the definition of political ideology? <laughs> what is that? Tell, tell me, you have learned that in political science. Come on. I told that before, so I know. You have learned. So don't try to run away. Well, <laughs> ideology is... Yeah, very similar. Okay, let me give you earlier yeah, one say something. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's close, yeah, it's closer. That's good. So basically, when we talk about political idea, ideology is a way of thinking of how to make your society better. Ah, thank you very much. You really studied. That's great. Okay, bravo. Great. Really, see? Let's look at the very definition of political ideology. Because everyone's ways of thinking, of making a better world, better society, is different, right? It's different. So ideology is very important too. Who, in who is in power matter a lot in political science. When we talk about politics, if you do not have power, when we talk about politics, if you do not have power, then you have no place, no ability to realize your political ideology. And then your ways of thinking about how to make a better society cannot be realized, right? So that's why politics emphasize on power. You need to have power so that you can realize your dream, your ideas, your political ideology. So political ideology is important too, okay? So Marx's emphasis on the crucial role of property rights in efficient economic organization and on the tension that developed between the existing body of property rights, this is the old society, and the productive potential of the new technology is a fundamental contribution. That is good for Marx, right? Marx emphasized the desire to protect your property is so strong. It's so strong, everyone wants to have that. And also emphasizing that the existing body of property rights cannot be used to protect the new property right 
produced by the new technology, right? So this is the tension. And his contribution is on here, the conflict between new technology and the old system. It's always there. So what would be the driving force for circular change? According to Marx, it is the technological change. And uh, the technological change cannot be realized automatically for a change of the new society. It has to be done by conflict between classes. So those who people who have, we call bourgeois. Those people who do not have, we call protestant, right? <laughs> we have two very fancy terms over there. Yosan Jieji and the Wusan Jieji. That would be great. So they were conflict. Conflict. Okay. So only after this kind of class conflict, the change can be realized. But the conflict is in, is in is violence in its nature, right? We don't want revolution. Would that be good to have a lot of revolutions? Of course not. Revolutions always ends bad. You have learned that from political science too. You must have, right? Okay, so let's take a next, next one. Yeah, it's great to have Marx's input about the importance of the technological change, but there are some limitations for that. And I have pointed out some of them. Okay, it include the first one, the limitation. The first one is the absence of the theory to account for the rate of technological change. So how soon, how fast the change of technology will be appear, appearing there. And also, also, Marx emphasized too much on technology, but did not mention other sources of change. For example, petroleum, the change of petroleum reserve, right? Or natural gas, gas and so on. There are a lot of change out there. He intentionally escaped from that kind of discussion. Why he wanted to do this? Well, uh, that would be much easier for, you, for him to elaborate his theory. If he, can, he include too many other factors then his theory is not simple at all. He tried to make his theory as simple as possible by only looking at the technological change. Okay, so here, for example, Marx slides, take lies of what? The crucial role of popula population change in history. It is true. Population change in history is also true. And it is understandable why Marx did not want population change to play a crucial role in his model. Understandable, but because including people, then he has to illustrate, he has to elaborate the restraints of the limited resources, right? So that's why he wants to include this. But incorporating population growth into a Marxian model could substantially increase his, his burning power, of course. The increasing of the population, right? And with the technology provides the supply for those people. And those people, when they grow in population, there would be an increasing number of the new class. That would be much better for explanation. Okay, so here we have a one simple conclusion. Technology alone simply cannot account for a great deal of circular change. That would be a little ridiculous. We have witnessed a lot of technological change, of course. But if we only look at this, that would be very narrow focused. Where the technology does not appear to have altered significantly, because a lot of technology, a lot of technology advances do not necessarily advance our society. For example, smartphones. Uh, we have a lot of different copyrights, intellectual property rights, saying that this smartphone is very unique, so I have one invention, right? But the other smartphone have carry very similar functions, and they have their technology change on the use of the smartphone. 
But there are so many smartphones out there. Which one is more important? They are equally important. They are equally insignificant in terms of changing the society. Is that right? Because this only an incremental change of the technology. So what kind of change are the so-called not incremental, but, but significantly different? It's very difficult for us, OK? And this, where technological change does not appear to have acquired fundamental organizational change in order to realize its potential. We talk about fundamental change for organization. It refers that all the regulation of the old organization cannot be used to fit the new technology. But in reality, in our society, we always could find some clauses, some regulation that it can be used to accommodate the need of the new technologies. There are a lot. At best, we can revise a bit. We do not need to overthrow the whole government in order to realize, right? For most of the time, we just change, we just advise, we just revise. That would be good enough. That would be good enough. Okay, so these are the limitations for Marxism. So, and uh, there's another limitation. We talk about classes. Just as I mentioned before, even though I am a user of the iPhone 14, but my interest is not the same as yours. Even you are also the user of the iPhone 14, right? So if we are classed in one class, well, we are not, we do not have the same interests. So basically, basically, you cannot say all the iPhone 14 users are in one class. That's too huge for analysis. Too huge for analysis, for meaningful analysis at all, right? Because all the people, all the users of iPhone 14 are not in the same interest category. Their purpose, their preference, their profoundness for using iPhone are all different, right? So basically, basically, if we use classes as the unit of the analysis is too huge, too huge, okay? Sometime, if we look back at Marx's original analysis, he only provides informal analysis, but not formal analysis on the class. Sometimes he, he agreed, he agreed to that. He said, oh, okay, this is true. Class is so huge, it is true. And uh, so he said that, oh, okay, we can say that there are two classes, bourgeois and protestant, proletariats, right? So we have two classes. Those people who have money, bourgeois, and those money who do not have money. Right? But even so, this kind of discussion amongst is also at best and the so-called ad hoc reasoning for temporary reason, temporary fix. It's not a sustainable argument. Even though you divide the classes into two, bourgeois and the pre proletariats, even though you have two, but that's still too huge, right? Too huge. So how can we have a better understanding of, uh, about the interest? If we focus on interest, then it would be better for us to focus on aggregation. Aggregation, a group of people determined by commonality of interest, may be, better, may be a better unit of analysis for us. So let's see this one. Aggregation, determined by commonality of interest, we call them as interest groups. Is that right? So here, interest group would be a better idea for us too, for more flexibility in the model without sacrificing this consistency. So the interest group, indeed, sometimes as large as a class as when the members view themselves as having common interest. But the key points here, people sharing with common interest, 
they identify themselves as one interest group. So interest group would be better for us to understand Marxism, interest group. So this emphasis on commonality of interest also allows one, us, to explore the conflicts within a class. So look here, we are all iPhone 14 users, right? If you see us as one class, but still we have internal conflicts because we have different interests. So one class, under one class, we will have many, many different kinds of interest groups. Or we can call, we have uh, many, many different kinds of aggregations de well, aggregation determined by commonality of interest, right? So interest group. So this is very important. And which, in fact, account for enormous amount of circular chain. The conflicts between among interest groups are the driving force for the change of the circular society. But not class. Class are too big. Classes are too big for analysis. But interest groups, yes. And the modern society, uh, modern politics are constituted based on interest groups. It's not only, not only in democracy, even in Russia, autocracy, they still have interest groups, okay? Ukraine, they have interest group too. Okay, so we use interest group, but not classes, to observe the social change. And uh, both cannot solve the free ride uh, problems. So here we have two models. Marxism and neoclassic approach. Yes, they are good. But they do, they lack the power to explain the free rider problem. What is a free rider problem? Those people who do not want to pay but want to get the benefits, that they are free riders. For example, um, The using of Wi-Fi, right? If you do not have the internet connection at your home, sometimes you go out to find the free Wi-Fi, right? You are free riders. You don't want to pay the fee for Wi-Fi, but you, you want to use the service. You are free riders. And these are the free riders' problems, right? You get benefits, but you don't pay. Okay, and the uh, free rider is actually the central to explaining group actions. And let's see this two, this one. Near classical economics, they use opportunity cost to explain free rider problem. And uh, its emphasis on relative prices. This one, near classical economic emphasis on opportunity cost and relative prices is a far more sophisticated tool for analysis when they talk about free rider problems. Then the cumbersome Marxist model built upon a labor theory of value. Okay, what is labor theory of value? That is every labor have some value. Even this labor dies, then it still has the so-called surplus value. Eventually can burn, use it as a fertilizer, some sort of that. So this is very cumbersome. But if you use opportunity cost to observe free rider problem, that would be a little bit easier. Why? Because in the time of you are searching for the free Wi-Fi, you have to forgive other opportunity to use other things, right? So that is your opportunity cost you cannot maintain. The time you use for searching free Wi-Fi and the uh, other way, you will, you will just give up some other things you need to do. That is opportunity cost. Okay, maybe good. So here in the book, as an analysis in chapter four, that's in the book of this, attempt to make clear. Extending neoclassical analysis to incorporate transaction costs. So now we see. We could use neoclassical analysis, but Oops. We can we can use this, and uh, by including this, 
it would be better for us to understand it can provide a crucial theoretical bridge to analyze economic organization and also to explore the tension between existing structural property rights and the productive production potential of economy. So basically, Neil's classical approach would be better for us to understand the circular chain, but with one condition, that is to consider transaction costs. You cannot transact infinitely, indefinitely for one thing because the cost is there, right? So you have to be very careful. You have to be careful about the transaction. You have to make a lot of rational choices out there. Okay, so here is the end of the discussion here. So now we talk about the change of the economic history, right? Structure. The structure started with the classical theory. They emphasize on the limited sole resources of land and uh, expansion nature, expanding nature of the population. And uh, later on after the Industrial Revolution, we have found out that neoclassical, pro, ne neoclassical economists introduced the new knowledge and the old possibility of the so-called substitutabilities to make uh, the supply possible to meet the expansion of the people. But they have flows, of course. So there's another uh, approach for understanding economic change, Marxism. Marxism emphasizes on the change of technology. Yes, to some extent, technological change can propel the change of the society. But the mechanism of the change is somewhat difficult to illustrate clearly. We do know if there is a new technology, then there will be a new class to use the technology. And we know that the new class of when they use the technology, they, they will look at the old society to see whether they can use it for potential. Sometimes they can, sometimes they don't. Even if they don't, they will try to re amend it by seeking revisions. Eventually, of course, there will be a possibility for revolution to overthrow the existing society. But this is very rough because the transitional mechanism of making this change is not discussed, fully elaborated from Marx at all. So what would be the better, better tool for us to understand society change, circular change of the economy? Maybe a combination of economic co opportunity cost and uh, transaction cost and the neo with the neoclassical approach to understand the use of technology, maybe. Okay, so now let's look at the etymology. We, now today I list a lot over here, right? I only give you some here. Now for example, determined. Determined come out from term. Term is end, it means end. For example, if someone you knew, you know is very ill, so it's a terminal year. Terminal means final. Terminal, ending. Terminal, we have a terminal here. Let's write this for you. If someone is, uh, has a terminal, terminal illness, then this one is very sick, okay? Ending. And when you say you determine it means that you cut it off, you end it up. DE means away. So you end it off. And end off means I don't want to consider more, that's it. So cut it off. End off. It's very similar to decide. Let's say decide. When we say decide, decide is equal to determine, right? is similar to determine. Why? Again, D means off or away. But how about side? Side means cut, to cut. CIS or CID means cut. So if you cut away something, it's similar to end off everything else, right? So determine is the synonym for decide. Side is cut. 
Okay, so I will leave all this to you, then you can uh, study by yourself. And the next part, we talk about tense. Tense is especially difficult for Taiwanese students here because in Chinese, we do not have the change of the verb tenses. We use adverbs, right? So if I say, it would be very difficult for foreigners to say, oh, when? Right now, or two days ago, or somewhere. So basically, in, in Chinese, we will say, when I say, I will use a verb. Right? When I step in class. So in class is a verb. But for English user, native speaker, they have no problem because they can change the tense. So how can we make ourselves get used to, to this kind of change of verb tenses? Well, basically there are two things you can learn. One is timeline. The other one is action points. Timeline and action points, what, what are they? Okay, let's see this one. <coughs> I use this one to give you some idea. This is the so-called timeline. This, from the past to now, this is now. And this is future. So you look at the action, when does it happen? So now let's look here, it is happen now, right? It is difficult to pin down the Marxist model since they appear is happen now. So appear over here. To be almost as many interpretation of Marx as they are is also here. It's a reality, a fact, it's just described. And look here, Marx regarded the. There's no problem with native speaker because they knew Marx when he regards, he regarded it before. So it is before, before, regarded. Technological change and not population growth as the primary engine of change. He was, he was before, right? You can see before. And he was critical of Matthew's view of the pe that, that people tend, this is the reality, this is the fact. He despised this, right? So use tend. And uh, people tend to breed for to subsistence and regarded, regarded coming out from was and uh, regarded. So was and regarded, right? So <coughs> what is, what, why we need to have the so-called timeline and action point? Because it can help you to identify the location of the action. You have to train yourself. If you are talking about something now, then use present tense. If you are talking something before happened, use past tense. For example, let me give you my oral statement about what I have done so far today. I woke up at 10 o'clock. Afterward, I brushed my teeth and used my bathroom, and I called out my two dogs and I brought them out and drove the car to the park. And I walked them for one hour, and then I came back home and I prepared my breakfast. See, I know what I was talking about was in the past, right? In the past. So I all used past tenses. It's not a science, it's just a habit. A habit. You have to train yourself this kind of habit, okay? And then now I'm teaching you English, right? <laughs> so I'm now teaching you. So now it's here, now it's here. Very easy. And uh, I will show you next Monday, I will teach you again <laughs> for another class. I will, see, because I have the kind of, this kind of sense, I know, when I talk about one action, when is the time for the happening? If it is in the past, past tense. If it is in the future, future tense. Even though I'm still a person living in Taiwan, my language, my native language is not English, 
still I know how to properly use the verb tenses. Timeline and action points, train yourself. And we have one workshop for this, of course, to fully train you. Okay, and then our assignment, we have four different assignments. First one, work with your team to identify what is the second economic revolution. Why, what is it to do with the settings of the article? Assignment number two, and we say that there's a fixed factor of land and resources and the expanding nature of population will together lead to a circular tendency for subsistence wage. I want you to explore one real case. Substantiating this statement and elaborate your observation. Talk with your team members, that'll be fun. We have so many poor people out there, right? Maybe. And also, number three, what are the dismal implications of the fall of the classic model of economy? Can population, as argued by Easter Bosch-Rob, sometimes act as a spur to induce new technology techniques that would dissolve the such dismal implications? The dismal implication, short to be short, is uh, the conflict between fixed resources and the expanding population. It's difficult. But Boshara said that no problem, population can induce new technology, right? Do you agree or not? Find something to argue about this. And number four, so what is the free rider problem mentioned in this article? Try to identify some real case to substantiate your arguments. Don't use the Wi-Fi stuff. <laughs> I use that. So it's copyright mine. It's only belong to me. Okay, so I will see you next time and uh, be happy. And please, do your TOEFL practice. And we still will have a quiz next time and a TOEFL practice Q&A time for the first hour of next Tuesday. See you then and thank you. Bye. Why don't you say thank you? Yeah, thank you very much.